not, that didn't happen too often, but uh, I was just reading last night in one of the books here that uh, one of the fellows, about one of the fellows, and he would said he hadn't had a bath in four months. So uh, you, you washed your face with whatever water you could find and, and kept halfway clean that way. We'd, we'd wash our socks out when we could. There was sufficient water there and something to, at least to keep them fairly clean so you didn't get trench foot. Or, of course, most of that was received from, uh, or as a result of being cold and wet, you'd get trench foot. Well, once in a great while, you'd find a place that had running water yet and hot water. And that was a real blessing. Buck and Koblenz, Trier, uh, in Trier, I think it was, well, I'm not sure on that, it been. And they had this exit for us uh, zeroed in, so as soon as the tank came out, the 88s would knock it out. So, uh, at that point, the captain had been hit, but, uh, Lieutenant Oxford went up there to get siege to what was going on, walking near the woods so he wouldn't be exposed. And waited a little while, the guard came running back and he said, Oxford wants a cup of coffee up there. I, I didn't know what to think then, but I had the, the makings of it in the back of the Jeep. So I went up, heated a little pot of water, and made coffee for him, went back and uh, got back there then. And the fe and, but in the meantime, I dug a trench right beside the concrete in the gravel so that I could crawl on it and drive back the Jeep up over that and then crawl under. And when I got back there, the fellows that are around there said, you're lucky you went, because in the meantime, then several planes had come over and strafed the highway. And there was a big hole right where my head would have been in the sand. So, a cup of coffee. There wasn't much protection there. It was a great little vehicle. Uh, didn't have any problems with it during the whole time I had it. We would check the oil and make sure that was ready, although the, we had three or four or five mechanics with us at all times and they would, uh, there was some little thing you thought was wrong, they'd check it out. We'd cross the Rhine River, and I'm sure it was the Rhine, by a boat, about 20 foot, I guess they call them assault boats, just aluminum type things. The engineer department had, were, was charge of it, so they were rowing us across. And there was probably 10 of us on the boat, and they'd go with, take 10 over, come back, and, because the bridges had been blown, so our vehicles were left on the shore then. Uh, we picked up our radio, and the radios in that time were about uh, six inches deep, uh, 14 inches square. And two of them fit together to make them work. I don't know if you've seen them or not. And uh, the guard had one, and I had the other, so we could go up with the... Uh, and I, th I don't remember if the captain was there at that time or not, probably. And uh, plus our pack that we had on our back, and rifle and canteen and all that stuff. When we got to the other side, of course, what they do to protect us, we had smoke going over us, thick so that they, because the Germans had it zeroed in sort of, they knew we were crossing there. Got to the other side and there's probably 40, 50 GIs laying like cordwood. And that, that really hit, hit me anyway. So then, when we got, all got over our group, started climbing that hill on the other side, and it was, I think it was pretty 45 degrees, not quite. Grapevines and all that, which helped, you just grab a hold of those and climb, climb, climb. I thought I would die. And we've been going since, this was getting dark then. And it was, uh, we've been going since early morning. Got up to where the, there was a road going around the mountain, cut in. 
and he, somebody there was drinking, keep on going around the road. And I walked a little way and I said, I'm going to sit down. So I sat down, I guess Buddy and I, whoever he was. And they hollered, keep going, keep going. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit here for a while. Well, just a few seconds later, two rounds hit just up another hundred feet. A shell of some kind hurt her. I don't know if it killed anybody, but injured some. Well, we kept on going that night then. And somewhere where we went, I don't know. Because <laughs> it was dark and we were just following our, our leaders. And we come over a little rise. <clears throat> and uh, then we were getting direct fire from somewhere down the line. I found a slit trench, not a slit trench, but a trench dug maybe a foot deep or so. So I crawled down into that. They did. Other fellows weren't moving. They were still shooting that way. I fell asleep. <laughs> this might, might have been two o'clock in the morning or so. So uh, I woke up, <laughs> nobody around. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm not going forward. So I walked back and in the dark then I found my unit was gone back maybe a couple of hundred yards. So uh, we'd been, advancing on the Autobahn and we came to a place where our vehicles really were getting hit bad and where a road crossed it overhead there's a big embankment on either side of that road so we pulled off there and we we're discussing if we should try and make a run for it or what and uh, talking and all of a sudden it must have been a mortar that could go high up and drop near us and uh, the shrapnel took a part of his leg off. And of course he dropped right to the ground right there. I called the medics and they came, managed him up a little bit. In fact, I put a tourniquet on his leg first so that he wouldn't bleed to death right there. And the uh, They took him away and then the sergeant came and told me, you go back about a half mile and back where the sort of a headquarters was following up and get uh, a replacement for C Captain Geiger. So I drove back and we were all coming on the right hand for two lanes. So I crossed over then and went on the other lane going the other direction. And they said, hurry up because we we want to keep going here. So I went as fast as the little old Jeep would go. And the Germans had done this quite often, I guess. They strung a wire just about, uh, well, neck height anyway, for the smaller vehicles. And, uh, but about three days before that, I had the mechanics weld a bar up from the, from the bumper with a hook on the end and brace so that uh, that would catch anything like that. Well, that caught one and uh, made it right through, no problem. So I got, got L L Lieutenant Oxford then. He was a fairly decent guy, but not, not, too, not too great a leader. But, uh, and then that was, East, that was Easter. No, that was Good Friday. Then on Easter, we were going to where I said we'd uh, hit that other traffic or opposition. And then they decided that they'd back a quarter of a mile and take a left through a sort of a, just a dirt road and go around and see if we could get at where that gun was. Well, all this time they were sending in tree bursts too. And tree bursts is where they shoot and either have it timed or get the treetops of these shells so that they would burst and spray uh, shrapnel all around. Really more dangerous than if they hit the ground. And we went up maybe a half a mile on that road. I was following, there was about three, four tanks ahead of me. And 
stopped, they stopped them, so I pulled up behind them. I was leery to do that because a tank can't see when it's backing up what you're running over. But I figured I'd get close to it anyway to, for protection. Okay, the captain, oh, uh, captain or Lieutenant Oxford then, and the guard walked back oh, 50 feet or so and were conversing with somebody else. And they got a few tree bursts and they both were hit. Uh, so I went back there and somebody had called the medics by that time, so I couldn't get by then, so I just waited. In fact, I crawled under the Jeep to keep away from the tree burst. Sweating out all the time, if that tank backs up, I better get out of there in a hurry. But they didn't, so I uh, backed up the Jeep then. In the meantime, the road was real narrow there, so I slid in the ditch, but I made it out, got back, and then I found out that they were uh, being shipped to the get get patched up somehow. One thing I remember, we were advancing there, and there was a German shoulder, soldier laying down on the ditch. His leg was hanging on only by some skin, and. Of course, I, I knew the medics were coming up back me, so there was nothing I could do really. But it wasn't bandaged up or anything, it was bleeding. <clears throat> but uh, that really hit me just that he could lay right there and, and eventually die if nobody took care of him. But I'm sure our medics did because they were, they were good to the enemy there. Well, first we, we were the first ones through it, I guess, and uh, took the any German uh, authorities out of there. But then we just kept going and somebody else then took care of the whatever else to do there. But then we didn't go far and we stopped for a day or two. So the officers made arrangements for us to go back and look at it. Um, I thought it was in Dachau, but uh, I'm, I don't have a record of it, so I'm not sure. And that was, it was terrible. The smell was dreadful. And uh, the people, some of them were there yet, just skin and bones, uh, walking skeletons, really. And one of the things that sticks in my mind was they had a trough made of two by sixes, dug in the ground, two by six on the bottom, then a two by six on each side to make a trough. It was about 30 feet long. And there they would have the uh, Persons that they want to get rid of lean over that so the blood would run in that. They'd shoot them then. And, uh, when they bled out, then they'd haul them away. And another area, the thing that really hit me there was there was a big fenced in area, oh, probably a hundred by a couple hundred feet, with little dog kennels, not little dog, dog kennels all the way around. What, had, what they had in those dog kennels was hungry dogs, nasty ones. And any gals that didn't cooperate with the soldiers, they would put them in there and let the dogs out on them. It's hard to realize how anybody could do that, but there was so much of that that I guess the Germans, some of them didn't think much of it. And then we took us through the gas chambers and the ovens where they burned them up. And, one little incident that uh, there was only three, I think, that we'd, and then that was at a time when we had to leave our vehicles behind, crossing the either the Saar or the Danube, I don't know which one it was, and uh, got up to where we were, and the captain says, "Take these back to." No, the, it must have been the captain. Uh, some group that followed us. There was. That was their job to take care of prisoners and uh, then come back here. They were probably my age, a little older maybe, I, I'm not sure. They, when they got their German uniform on with their long coats and that, they, they all looked the same. So I was marching them back and that time we'd been going all day across the river and then all night this was in the afternoon again, and I was so tired. I, I could have just sat down right there and gone to sleep. But then uh, we met a, a platoon or so of 
real rough looking guy. They must have come from another area where they'd uh, unkept, you know, not shaven or anything like that. Regular combat. And they said, where, where are you taking those? I said, take them back to, and I mentioned the place. He said, give them to us, we'll take care of them. Uh, what they were going to do is take them behind a shed there someplace and get rid of them. I said, no, I can't do that. So I took them on back and then went back to my company. I'm glad I did that. It saved me yeah. from thinking about that the rest of my life. Our, our outfit, the 20th Armored Infantry, had the job of, uh, some, some called them the Phantoms, because we would, after we advanced all day, go into a place, get set up, maybe have lunch or dinner, whatever it was, and then the order would come down, move out. So we'd start, this by dark by this time, we'd probably go 20 miles, we'd break through the lines, the German lines, and just keep going till we found a spot. I don't know how they ever knew where, where they were gonna go, but uh, somebody had given them orders. And, but in a column like that, and I don't know, there were probably 30, 40, 50 vehicles total, bunch of tanks in front of me and some in back and jeeps and half tracks and all that. But we stopped column stop, you know, a column does stop and then go and stop and go. And uh, I'd shut off the engine to conserve on gas. I didn't know how long it was before we got gas again. And it was cold. We'd been going since probably six o'clock that morning. And by 11 o'clock, you got sleepy. Especially when there's no action right then. And the first Lieutenant Novicus, I don't know how I remember that name when I, <laughs> but he was a, something else. <laughs> Lieutenant Novicus reached back and at that time we didn't have a guard with us either. So he wouldn't, he was no help. Uh, he had a down sleeping bag. He crawled in that and he was comfortable. And he, was sitting there. he went to sleep, I went to sleep and why I woke up, I don't know. I woke up like this, looked ahead of me, there was not a vehicle there. So I started the Jeep and we called them peeps. 